like you had a yeah, adventure. Yeah. yeah. All right, uh, Dr. Hornick has made his way here f through the uh, dangerous passes of I-80 from the uh, eastward, uh, wayward areas of Iowa City. Uh, Dr. Hornick comes to us uh, from University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics. He's, uh, what I would say, he's kind of an embarrassment of riches in that he is one of the, the, the best pulmonologists you're ever going to find. He has expertise in cystic fibrosis and critical care medicine and general pulmonology. Um, and so we're really lucky to have him here today. Uh, as he's getting set up, I'll tell you a little bit about what he's going to talk about. He's going to take us through the alphabet soup of how we classify uh, facility-acquired pneumonias, and I think that's a very germane topic right now, particularly as we uh, try to code for appropriate severity for inpatients, uh, and also with the upcoming ICD-10 uh, coding this uh, fall, we'll need to be able to uh, decide how we uh, label these types of um, acquired pneumonias. So with that, we'll turn over to Dr. Hornick. Hey, um, just how I drive this thing, which way, how do I push the... You can either use this button, okay. or you can use the left. Okay, yep. good. And then the pointer, I'll just put on the and screen. There's a, yep, and there's a pointer on here, this uh, bottom one. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, your patience uh, waiting for me uh, to get here. I um, do have a lot to talk about, so I will probably... Uh, rush through some of the slides. I have to give a little nod to George Carlin, one of my favorite philosophers. He asked questions like, would a fly without wings be called a walk? Or can vegetarians eat animal crackers? Um, and why do they put braille on the number pads on drive through bank machines? And if you try to fail but succeed, which have you really done? Uh, so, um, this, I like to ask questions throughout and give you definitions as well. Arbitrator is a cook that leaves Arby's to go. I'm just going to skip these because I ran out of time. Subdue, that's what my son says, uh, like a guy who works on one of those like submarines. A subdue, all right. <laughs> definitions. Um, you guys are probably familiar with some of these um, definitions. N NP nosocomial pneumonia. HCAP, how many of you have heard of HCAP? I'm sure you have. Uh, healthcare associated pneumonia, HAP, hospital associated pneumonia, and ventilator associated pneumonias. I'll talk a little bit about the pitfalls and the diagnosis of these types of pneumonias. I'm going to focus a lot of what I say on ventilator associated pneumonia because that's where a lot of the research really lies. And we can make more specific recommendations, and of course, it's the deadliest of these nosocomial pneumonias. A little bit about the pathogenesis and how that leads to the prevention strategies that we use. Um, if I have time, antibiotic selection. And um, what I hope to, uh, to cover is what I think is pretty good data for keeping the antibiotics that we use for this particular diagnosis, particularly ventilator-associated pneumonia, the duration relatively short. Um, let me just ask here, if you've got a patient in your ICU who develops an infiltrate, looks like they have pneumonia, how long, and you start them on antibiotics appropriately, how long should you keep them on antibiotics? Until the pharmacist tells you to stop, okay. Um, 10 days, I heard somebody say. 10 to 14 days, if you look at the guidelines, is what they say. But I would argue that for the majority of patients, eight or seven days is probably sufficient. And in fact, many patients can be stopped after three days because oftentimes by three days, it's apparent they really didn't have pneumonia in the first place. So. Um, that's one of the most, if I, you know, if I'm not going to run out, if I'm going to run out of time, it's probably one of the most important things that I'd like to sort of leave you thinking about. about. So getting back to the terminology, um, I look at these, these pneumonias as a spectrum. And of course, I've actually been here before and talked about community-acquired pneumonias. But on the spectrum of pneumonias, those um, that we're going to talk about today, 
I would say these are the nosocomial pneumonias, healthcare associated, which is a relatively new term. It's been around for now about 10 years. Um, it really uh, is, the def definition is those patients between truly community acquired and those that acquire their, their uh, pneumonia in the hospital. So those that have been around healthcare a lot, like nursing homes, um, but not necessarily in a hospital, or a chronic dialysis unit, those kinds of patients uh, have had frequent hospitalizations um, and or have been on IV antibiotics in the past month. So that would be healthcare-associated pneumonia. Hospital-acquired and ventilator-associated pneumonia are basically those people that acquire the pneumonia at least 48 hours after they get into the hospital. So that's sort of the spectrum. Whoops. So um, nosocomial pneumonia epidemiology, it's very common, nosocomial pneumonia, amongst nosocomial infections, you'll hear it listed as second or third in the list of nosocomial infections behind urinary tract infections or skin and soft tissue infections. Um, but the thing that distinguishes this one from those other nosocomial infections is this carries the highest mortality. Mechanical ventilation is the biggest risk factor for nosocomial pneumonias, and um, that's why we pay a lot of attention to studying ventilator-associated pneumonia. And if you look at ventilator-associated pneumonia rates, it's between 0 and 6 per 1,000 ventilator days. 25% of all ICU infections are ventilator-associated pneumonia, and it accounts for at least half of the antibiotics that are prescribed in an ICU. And CMS uh, and other um, insurance entities are looking at a benchmark of zero VAP and the threat that this is a non-reimbursable uh, complication because with prevention we can greatly reduce the numbers of these and in some hospitals even to zero. So HCAP, just to finish out the um, description of this subset that may not be as familiar to everybody is that um, they're really, if you look at the types of bugs, which I try to show on this slide, the patients with community acquired pneumonia are going to have things like strep pneumonia, hemophilus, probably some pseudomonas in certain situations, but in fact, the patients with HCAP, this in the purple bars here, are going to have more gram negatives, they're going to have more MRSA, and they're going to look more like, uh, in terms of the types of organisms in a lot of situations, more like nosocomial, hospital-acquired, or even ventilator-associated pneumonias. So that's the point of this slide. And then when you look at the cost compared to community-acquired pneumonia, uh, in terms of length of stay and actual dollars, um, it is HCAP sort of falls between community and, um, or I'm sorry, between community acquired pneumonias, again in the sort of purple bar here, or light purple, and those with truly hospital acquired. Um, so again, it's a sort of a transitional, uh, that's the point. And then if you look at the uh, mortality, the mortality approaches more that of a hospital associated pneumonia as opposed to uh, community-acquired pneumonias. I put a little question mark here when I look at VAP because it reminds me to say uh, this sort of epiphenomenon when you start to really focus in on VAP, and that is that um, many of these patients that um, get ventilator-associated pneumonia, you sometimes wonder whether it's uh, a manifestation of their persistent critical illness. That is, they develop the ventilator-associated pneumonia as part of their pre-terminal event because they've had so many organ system failures versus a ventilator-associated pneumonia causing death. So in other words, there is, I think this is one of the factors when we start to talk about this high mortality and response to treatment that sort of plagues us and makes it difficult for, um, uh, to really manage some of these sicker patients. If you get what I, I'm saying here, is that some of this excess mortality is just a virtue, 
is, is uh, because a patient develops what looks like ventilator-associated pneumonia, but they already have other problems uh, that are critical, and uh, probably the ventilator-associated pneumonia in those case situations is sort of a manifestation of an end-stage event. You know, it has been cold lately, and some people say, I took this slide, uh, a picture that hell has frozen over and it's not going to get warm again, but I, I really don't believe that. Um, <clears throat> nosocomial pneumonia pathogenesis. I'm going to, um, let's see, I think I might go through this fairly quickly because, uh, again, I started late. But um, just a couple of things uh, that I'm going to highlight. Uh, the fact is that uh, when we put people in the hospital, because of their illness or because of things we do in the hospital, their defenses are impaired. And then um, we uh, set up a situation where larger loads of bacterial um, pathogens are going to get into the lower respiratory tract and overwhelm a host defense that's present and pretty potent most of the time, except for when there's a presence of illness. So. Um, and then the organisms that we see in the hospital are those that are a little bit more virulent, the things like gram-negative pseudomonas, um, MRSA, or Staph aureus, really. So um, aspiration is probably the single most important route of entry. And if you think about hematogenous or inhalation, there's no question these patients most often get the bugs down in the lower tract from aspiration. Now, many of us aspirate when we're sleeping, um, and more people aspirate when they're sick and in the hospital. And there's new techniques that show that you can track oral pharyngeal organisms into the lower respiratory tract in the hospital. It's the density is lower uh, as you go down around the oral pharynx and down into the lung. But I think that's, that's really the point, is that um, that's the source of these organisms uh, from the gastrointestinal tract, the oral pharynx, and then down into the lung, and it's overwhelming the local um, host defenses there. And the um, illnesses predispose these patients to develop a sort of transition to gram-negative and uh, staph aureus type colonization. And uh, upper airway colonization with these bugs coexists, uh, or these bugs, leads to pneumonia. So what are some of the things that uh, sort of predispose to aspiration? The gag reflex is impaired. We, the patient's illness or the drugs we give them alter their consciousness and their ability to protect their airway. We put devices in that create sort of a pathway to the lung. And G-tube uh, uh, allows um, a material to get up into the oral pharynx, and then the endotracheal tube helps direct them down into the lungs. Many of these patients have esophageal disease already, reflux, and we, a lot of times, put these patients flat on their back. If you look at the bacterial uh, uh, entry, thinking about the endotracheal tube, I already mentioned this, that bypasses the host, impairs lower tract and fence, uh, defenses, uh, secretions can pull from the endotracheal tube cuff, all right? Um, we get condensate into the, um, in the um, exhalation port that can be sometimes inadvertently sent back down the endotracheal tube with uh, moving the patient. Um, that's one of the things that you can see happening when we move the patient to the gurney to take them to the CT scan. That's why transitioning in and out of the ICU is so dangerous. And of course, sometimes the devices we use for respiratory therapy can become uh, contaminated and introduced down through the endotracheal tube. So <clears throat> the point is, a lot of these things that we do lead to aspiration, and aspiration uh, leads to pneumonia. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, aerosol and hematogenous should be mentioned, but they're not a major um, <clears throat> factor. And, you know, I'm on this theme of, of weather and, and it being cold. Have you seen the latest uh, Iowa weather map? Uh, this is what the um, groundhog said after seeing his shadow, apparently. All right. So um, risk factors for colonization of the nosocomial uh, uh, and for nosocomial pneumonia actually overlap. 
and there are patient related factors which again I've sort of alluded to and for the interest of time you can look at that list um, and uh, I'll just move on infection control uh, related factors remember the hands of the personnel are in sometimes a factor in the hands of the patient again I pointed out we've created sort of a highway for bacterial transition by putting endotracheal tubes and those and, and NG tubes into place and uh, again contaminated hands uh, the uh, anal oral uh, uh, ability to transition organisms as well usually the patient but sometimes the healthcare personnel um, <clears throat> so uh, interventions uh, we give sedatives we put them through surgery we use a lot of antibiotics again the theme will be how can we avoid that when we think about pneumonia and I didn't mention this yet but the longer a, a, an endotracheal tube is in place the more likely it actually only takes 48 hours before it's encrusted with a bacterial biofilm and we're sliding that uh, suction tube back and forth through that uh, endotracheal tube and dragging clumps of that stuff down into uh, the lower respiratory tract and then the secretions above the cuff the cuff itself does that prevent aspiration does water or secretions above the cuff get down below the cuff yeah all the time all right so the cuff is really um, mainly there to prevent um, dislodge and, and to seal so that you get uh, uh, adequate uh, ventilation but it really is not very effective at protecting the lower airway uh, and, and in fact it provides a little nidus for secretions now we do know and I've got a slide about this that what you use for um, the material of the endotracheal tube and of the cuff is sometimes um, can reduce the amount of organisms and I'll show you a slide about that so we can do things to help minimize the risk but the risk is still there so we put patients flat on their back we give them feedings that fills up their stomach again the, 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 the feedings are enriched with uh, material that the bugs love to live on and uh, easily uh, gets colonized and in, down into the um, into the lungs the nasal gastric tube affects the lower esophageal function and we know that uh, things that block acid in the stomach increase the likelihood of um, <clears throat> pneumonia and I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail so there's modifiable risk factors um, uh, avoid intubation or make it as short as possible keep the patient in a 30 degrees upright uh, position um, nutrition is helpful to help uh, maintain the um, the ability to fight infection prevention of, uh, of stress of stress ulcers is important on mechanical ventilation because it reduces the risk of bleeding and uh, that risk is greater than the risk of pneumonia and <clears throat> we don't give transfusions as much anymore and we certainly do things to help minimize um, uh, things like um, glu uh, glucose uh, high levels of glucose a little bit better than we used to although tight control is not as necessary now what about the bugs so they're uh, key one of the key things is from a lot of the data is that it's not just a single organism it's usually polymicrobial all right so we got to keep that in mind and then um, the data also shows that the types of bugs that are present vary as in terms of the time that the patient duration the patient has been in the healthcare setting so those that develop their pneumonia such as a trauma case that develops a pneumonia within a couple of days of arriving into the ICU are more likely to have the pathogens that you would see for community acquired pneumonia although there is a trend towards more gram negatives those patients that are definitely been in are more medical and have been in the ICU or been in the hospital for an extended period of time certainly more than uh, 48 hours are more likely to have more resistant gram-negative types of organisms like Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter, Klebsiella, Stenotrophomonas multifilia, and um, MRSA. Um, 
And usually we don't see too often anaerobes, fungi, mycobacteria in this particular setting. So let's talk a little bit about the diagnosis and um, how good are we at making the diagnosis of pneumonia in the ICU or in the hospital? You think you're better at it than I am? Think I'm better at it than you are? You can tell by the way I'm asking this question, we're probably both pretty bad at it, okay? And how, you know, are we bad in that we miss them when they're present? No, it's the reverse. We're more likely to be misled into thinking it's a pneumonia uh, than <clears throat> the reverse, which is missing a pneumonia. Now, and if you think about the clinical criteria, which I put down for you here, basically a chest x-ray with new or progressive infiltrates, a fever, white count, and secretions that look purulent on gram stain, generally, it's very sensitive but it's not very specific. In fact, if you, uh, this, I put this up because all of these things that are not pneumonia can cause infiltrates in a fever and the patient will have all the criteria that I showed on the previous page. So that's the conundrum. And I wish I could stand here and tell you I've got a solution for you. We'll be able to distinguish these things on the slide from pneumonia. I'll tell you, I can't do that very well, but what I can do, and what I think I'll show you in, as we get uh, through to the last quarter of this uh, talk, is that you can get progressively more um, confident through the course of this patient's respiratory illness that it's not pneumonia and stop, or the pneumonia's cured, and stop antibiotics early, which is about the best uh, we can do. So diagnostic approaches, Controversies still persist. The clinical approach versus bronchoscopic or non-bronchoscopic quantitative cultures of the lower airway. Do you guys do those here? I haven't found anybody that says they do those, at least in this region. We have done them. We, done them. we did them more when we did clinical trials for uh, ventilatory associated pneumonia than we do now. The bottom line is that, and it's not done very often, and appropriately so, because it's costly and uh, in, invasive and uh, doesn't affect mortality, although it may help with diagnosis. Caveats, there's no gold standard for diagnosing pneumonia, and uh, many of these patients may have more than pneumonia, other infections, urinary tract, bloodstream infection. Um, and one of the things that made it difficult for us to study pneumonia in our ICU is that patients arrived to us with their pneumonia already on antibiotics, or they developed their pneumonia while they were on antibiotics. So one of the things to kind of get around this that um, has actually gotten a lot of traction is prevention. What methods are available? Of course, uh, we want to prevent disease um, if and when possible. So efficacy that uh, I think is a given is hand washing and vaccinations and isolation of the patients with resistant pathogens. Um, careful handling of the ventilator tubing. How often should the ventilator tubing be changed? Every day? Every 48 hours? Every month? Right, when it gets dirty, basically, all right? It, um, intuitively, we used to think you change it frequently because look at all that stuff in there. But it turned out that the more frequently you changed it, the more likely the patient was gonna get pneumonia. And part of that was because just with handling the tubing, you often ended up sending some of that uh, material back down the endotracheal tube. I'll mention something about the technology of the endotracheal tubes that has improved. Um, and so let's uh, go and look at that. Uh, there's the 
do you guys use this type of uh, endotracheal tube, the continuous uh, subglottic secretion aspiration tube? I'm not surprised if you don't. Uh, I haven't found a lot of people using this either. Um, the studies, two studies that really were pivotal, pivotal here, did not demonstrate overwhelmingly that these things did any better than a standard endotracheal tube, but it you know, intuitively made sense that if you could reduce the volume of this super, uh, uh, of this subglottic secretions above the um, cuff, maybe you could make a difference on pneumonia. But the latest data shows that keeping the cuff pressures relatively high and a tapered cuff and a polyurethane cuff, that's what I was mentioning earlier, polyurethane uh, cuff uh, is better than the polyvinyl chloride cuff at reducing uh, at least has an effect on the growth of organisms within that material, and there seems to be a beneficial effect in subsequent uh, pneumonia. So we've switched to the polyurethane in part because of this data. The other data that I mentioned earlier, and I don't think I need to go into uh, a lot of uh, detail, um, is that it's clear that you uh, keep the head of the bed up by 30 degrees. That's all it takes. It does reduce substantially the rate of pneumonia. We don't really have to worry about the size or the placement of the, in, of the uh, feeding tube. Just get the feeding tube in place as early as possible and start feeding. Um, <clears throat> but realize uh, there's some risk involved, and as soon as the patient can eat, switch back to oral uh, uh, feedings. Um, if possible. And then GI bleeding is a big problem in the ICU without prevention and patients that are on the ventilator. So you need to use um, uh, antacids of some sort. And bottom line is uh, there has been data out there that suggested suppressing acid in the stomach led to more pneumonias. But these data here showed that the rates of pneumonias were not high enough uh, to uh, recommend any alternative or no uh, antacid therapy because the risk of GI bleeding was even higher. So <clears throat> basically, uh, the other things that are used is comprehensive oral care, uh, biofilm debridement plus uh, chlorhexidine, uh, non-invasive support, ventilation, instead of mechanical ventilation, wherever you can. I mean, most of our COPD patients in exacerbation now don't get intubated nearly as often as they used to. And then the make use of therapist-driven uh, vent liberation protocols. Do you guys use that here? We use that in our medical ICU. We still don't have it in place in the surgical ICU. Um, but, uh, and I'll, I'll mention that a little bit uh, later, but daily sedation vacations, of course, that's uh, uh, something that's uh, pretty well accepted. And that's what you find on the ventilator bundle, all right? And that's why they're there, because the data supports uh, better outcomes. Uh, and they're straightforward practices. Um, these are the ones that um, I think you're all familiar with, head of the bed, sedation, vacation. Uh, make sure the patient's extubated as soon as possible. Uh, stress ulcer prevention and DVT uh, prevention. These things have made a difference. Here's our data here in our MICU. I would show you our SICU data. We've won that race, so I won't show, I'll just say that, and surgeons aren't here to uh, argue with me or the anesthesiologist. But anyway, at this point, we, uh, right here at this point, uh, we were using the bundle for a couple years, as you can see, uh, and variably, uh, the rates were relatively low, five, um, uh, you know, in some months, five uh, or less uh, ventilator-associated pneumonias um, per thousand ventilator days. Well, we actually, since that point, we have been VAP-free for a thousand plus days uh, and beyond. And what really made the difference was the establishment of a VAP team with an enthusiastic, effective leadership we updated the equipment, as I mentioned. The simplest thing that we did actually was change the endotracheal tubes to polyurethane, and I don't know how much that had the impact. I really think it was the comprehensive staff education that from the nursing, nurses' aides, 
uh, all the way up to the MDs, buy-in at all those levels led to a synergism that was totally unanticipated. We're usually a pretty um, quiet and negative bunch, but uh, <laughs> this seemed to really uh, mobilize enthusiasm where I didn't think it possibly could, and um, the effect was extraordinary. So, and as I mentioned, we really had to switch our research interests because we didn't have any more ICU pneumonias and we couldn't enroll patients uh, into those types of trials uh, because we just didn't have them, which was fun. And uh, it was good to have that problem. We've, we've certainly done other things. But uh, talking about fun facts, you know, it is impossible to lick your elbow. And it's physically impossible, and this is a place where everybody knows this, it's physically impossible for pigs to look up into the sky. Don't, and the other thing is 25% of all photocopy of false water water are caused by people sitting on them photocopying their butts. I've got that in a paper, uh, the Journal of Useless Information. Uh, it uh, was published in 2010. Wearing headphones or earbuds for just an hour will increase the bacteria in your ear by 700-fold. Tell that to your teenage son or daughter, you're guaranteed a one-finger salute. And a duck's quack doesn't echo, and no one knows why. And 75%, some of you have already started, have, uh, will go out and try to lick their elbow. You know, I've been showing this to medical students for the last, oh, almost 15 years. And it turns out there are two medical students, uh, Megan and Sarah, who are able to lick their elbow. Sarah, or Megan, had a lot of lubrication there on the table which um, it was downtown somewhere, but Sarah met me right outside, and I put up the challenge for the last five years because only women came up to me afterwards and showed me that they could do it. But this year, Jeremy and Anthony, <laughs> just last week, in fact, showed me that men indeed could do this. So uh, I now um, have quite a complete set of people that defy the, uh, that statement, and I'm probably going to have to change this, but <clears throat> it does seem to be a rare one. And um, if you're one of those rare people who can do this and you want to be part of my wall of shame or fame, I'll put a black bar over your eyes so you can know exactly who you are, um, and we'll put you up here. Now, I'm not having much time here, but let me just say that treatment uh, in the ICU, all kinds of ways, less is more. Basically, tidal volume, less tidal volume is more in ARDS. Um, less delay before starting treatment for sepsis is better. Less invasive monitoring. When's the last time you used the swan gans line? Yep, uh, people have not even heard of that. Uh, blood transfusions, less of those. Less weaning from mechanical ventilation, right? We don't wean anymore, we just take them off. Uh, take them off as soon as they're ready. And what I want to point out is we should be saying less antibiotic use for ventilator-associated pneumonia. I'm going to just say, because um, I know that we're at the end of this time, you know, clinical diagnosis makes it difficult. I said it's high sensitivity and low specificity. Um, and if you look at antibiotic overuse, if you will, in ventilator-associated pneumonia, 49, I already said this, 50% of all ICU antibiotics are for ventilator-associated pneumonia, and two-thirds of those are for suspected not proven. And, you know, empiric use of, for an infiltrate occurs between 34 and 75 percent. So there's a direct relationship between resistance and antibiotic re, uh, uh, overuse. And we're, there's a pressure also that we feel to use antibiotics, which I think is appropriate because we know that the mortality of ventilator-associated pneumonia is associated with a delay. The longer the delay, the more likely that patient's not going to do well. And you guys already admitted to me, you're going to start antibiotics quickly uh, because you know how lethal this particular problem is. And then the second thing is, of course, if you're not appropriate in your selection of the antibiotics, the patient's not going to do very well as well. And so we have this anxiety that we have a treatable nosocomial infection if we don't get on it right away or don't treat it you know, with a, a broad enough course of antibiotics, the patient's not going to be do well, do well. So that's kind of the pressure to use antibiotics. And what I'd like to say is that, yes, start the antibiotics early, be broad, but be willing to stop once you have an alternative explanation or once it's clear that this patient's getting 
better quickly. And usually that can happen within three days and certainly by seven days. I already pointed out that invasive and quantitative techniques really is no gold standard. It's a high maintenance technique. It's costly with questionable uh, uh, application and uh, additive effect to outcomes. It doesn't alter mortality. But I think it is a realistic expectation to shorten and eliminate antibiotics for patients who are less likely to have or quickly respond uh, with their pneumonia. And what can we use to help us? Well, have you heard of the CPIS system? Do you use that here? Let me just go over that quickly. And I think there's a role for biomarkers here too, and I'll talk about that quickly. So the CPIS system really goes back to around um, the 1990s. It's been around for a long time. It's a 12-point scale, two points for each of these things. Some of these are the clinical criteria you'd be used to, but it also involves arterial oxygenation, uh, a, a, a more quantitative assessment of the character of the tracheal secretions, and it asks you to look at the culture results. So you, the point of doing this is you do it at the beginning, and you do it again at three days when you've got the culture results. And if the patient has a six points or more, or more than six points, they have pneumonia, and you should continue the antibiotics. But if by three days it's dropped below six, then you could stop the antibiotics. And the outcomes from this have been tested against the best gold standards that we have, which is bronch and blind catheter semi-quantitative cultures, which you know, correlates fairly well with pneumonia by autopsy studies. And this was first proposed in the 90s, and there have been several studies that have looked at it in a randomized controlled way, that, as best as you can in a, in a randomized controlled way, and identified that patients by three days, you can identify those patients with a score of six or less, that VAP is unlikely, and you should have an alternative explanation, and you could usually stop the antibiotics at that point. And if it drops below six by seven or eight days, you can finish the antibiotics in those individuals. So I think it's a, a, a nice clinical um, adjunct that you can apply when you're thinking specifically about that patient with an infiltrate. And then the other adjunct, which I wonder, do you use any of these? I know there's quite a list of things that have been studied. Procalcitonin, S-TREM, uh, pancreatic stone protein, surfactant protein D, IL-1 beta, C-reactive protein, both in serum, lavage, and exhaled condensate. I would say, out of all of these, the one that probably shows the most promise, and I am still surprised it's not being used uh, more routinely, and I, I come here to ask you, are you using a procalcitronin? Uh, so it certainly uh, seems in community-acquired pneumonia and in ventilator-associated pneumonia, it may be a, 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 an adjunct that can help us with a high enough level, reassure us that an infection is present, and you should keep that patient, or start that patient on antibiotics. But <clears throat> where I think it has greater strength, it's been shown by this meta-analysis that was published just in the last couple of years, that it reduce, you can reduce antibiotic use and the duration better than you can with traditional methods, not the CPIS, but traditional clinical methods, that is, leave it to the physician to decide. And it's been applied in antibiotic stewardship, particularly in Europe, and shown that there's a substantial decrease uh, in the level of antibiotic use in the ICU for pneumonia. So once this, the, um, the procalcitonin level drops below a threshold, the physicians in a lot of ICUs in Europe are used to that being a marker for when to stop that patient's antibiotics, which may, often is well before 10 days and closer to seven to eight days. So um, <clears throat> here's a, a sort of landmark study that came out of St. Louis back at 2000. And again, it showed before and after a sort of uh, more definitive uh, protocol to keep the antibiotics at seven days. And what they basically showed was there's no difference in mortality compared to historic controls. And they've just done a meta-analysis of all the randomized controlled trials over the last decade. 
since their original studies, and again, have shown that at seven or eight days, there's no difference in mortality compared to those who receive antibiotics for 10 to 15 days. Obviously, the short courses have patients in that group always have many more antibiotic-free days, and they're usually on average of three and a half days um, is, a, uh, is the mean, and less antibiotic-related complications, such as renal failure and uh, C. diff. So the recommendation I want to leave you with is strongly consider seven or eight days for ventilator-associated uh, ventilator pneumonia. Consider using the CPIS, which is something that's easy to calculate, and use it to watch how the patient's doing and decide at three days, five days, and seven days whether you really still need to continue the antibiotics. And it might be worth looking into the procalcitonin as another adjunct uh, for the same purpose. Again, more towards the antibiotic stewardship piece. The problem with the procalcitonin is it is, it is a mail-out test, and it's still a little bit too expensive, that's what our lab tells us, uh, to have it in-house. And, um, and it's not real practical for the immediate turnaround time quite yet that you'd like to see, at least in the uh, commercially available um, uh, uh, kits that uh, are in uh, laboratories. So I've tried to point out that we don't have precise diagnostic uh, techniques quite yet. You can shorten antibiotics um, three, seven days, three days stop if there's evidence of no, uh, if the evidence for pneumonia has disappeared. I want to point out, I'm not telling you not to be aggressive to start. So frappe fort and frappe vite, that is hit them hard and hit them fast. Broad spectrum antibiotics, avoiding missing resistant organisms. But when you have the cultures back at three days, you can narrow or stop the antibiotics if you have an alternative explanation. So <clears throat> I think um, I'm not going to have enough time. This is the reference that I think has stood the test of time since 2005 uh, for selecting the appropriate antibiotics. I've showed you part of this slide, the etiology for early. Uh, these are the antibiotics. I don't think there's a lot of argument when you've got risk for M multiple drug resistant uh, antibiotic or pathogens such as Pseudomonas. You need to use combination therapy generally. I actually still rely on aminoglycosides combined with a beta lactam using extended interval dosing uh, aminoglycoside um, protocol for the younger patients or patients without any renal disease. It's simple. Um, MRSA, there's been um, a lot of discussion about linazolid versus vancomycin. Uh, there's certainly faster clearance of MRSA with linazolid, but the mortality when you compare the two is no different. So we still use vancomycin uh, uh, predominantly. So again, my urge to stop at 72 hours and reevaluate, I think I'll stop at this point. Talked about HCAP, HAP, BAP, preventive techniques, the role of all levels of care in making that work, and the enthusiastic team really make the difference in our ICU. Um, VAP treatment, less is more, just like everything else we're doing in the ICU. We're not able to make the diagnosis precisely, so you need to be broad and aggressive early, but the data really is pointing towards stopping antibiotics short, eight days, seven days. Um, maybe we're at the happy ending here, but not there. Just keep smiling. Thank you. Sorry I was late. Uh, thank you for staying this long. Thank you very much. Uh, prescriber's letter, uh, community acquired pneumonia, uh, they suggested using instead of uh, uh, the uh, fluoroquinolones uh, and um, azithromycin uh, for pneumonias using uh, like augmentin uh, because the uh, others are getting more resistance. Uh, and then the second part of that, can we get by with seven days? Yes. So yes, the uh, second part I think you can get by with shorter. I actually, and are you talking about hospitalized? Community acquired. Community, but pay outpatient management for community acquired pneumonia. 
Yeah, you know, I think that's fine. I'm not even sure it matters which antibiotics we use. Honestly, in the outpatient uh, setting, mortality is pretty much the same across the board. So um, I, we haven't seen the quinolone resistance and the macrolide resistance. So, um, but you know, you need to keep track of your own antibiogram, looking at pneumococcus, really, in that uh, particular group um, uh, of patients. So, answer is, I think you. I have no problems with the um, that that recommendation. Others. <laughs> On the preventive stuff, um, with sedation vacation, we generally have, you know, people are on for a pretty short amount of time. Is it really, how beneficial is it for short ventilation? So what do you mean by short? Oh, two days? I mean, it's three, four days. Um, I think after two days, you need to be doing it. Sorry, I missed the earlier part of this. Why is procalcitonin a predictor of whether or not they have pneumonia? Well, it's, it's a good question, because the name does not suggest, uh, you know, suggests some involvement with bone metabolism, which is how it was first discovered. But it also is released by neutrophils. And so it's a, um, so it's a marker of neutrophil influx, basically. And um, seems to be very specific in this particular uh, situation. I'm not, and I don't study it in the laboratory, so I can't tell you much more than that. Any infection or just pneumonia infection? Uh, good question. So um, I'm not aware of it being used in any other infections, such as urinary tract infections, no, and uh, sepsis, yes, it's, it has a similar a role in patients that have bacterial-related sepsis syndrome. Um, so, uh, if if uh, so, you could use it. Just so you can use it anytime uh, you've got those kinds of situations with a systemic infectious process. I don't think urinary tract infection reaches to that level most of the time. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.